Welcome everybody <laughs> to the uh, um, annual uh, public workshop for the San Onofre uh, Nuclear Generating Station um, Reef Mitigation Project. My name is Dan Reed. I'm a research biologist at UC Santa Barbara and the Marine Science Institute. And what we're gonna do today is I'll start off with a brief overview and introduction to the project and that'll be followed by my colleague, Dr. Rachel Smith, who is going to be talking about um, the results from the previous year's monitoring, and then our last presentation by Dr. Kat Behesti is going to talk about kind of what we've learned from the 25 years that we've been monitoring this project. <clears throat> I'd like to mention that um, uh, this is just one of two major components for the mitigation of of the San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant, or SONGS. Um, the other main component of the mitigation is a wetland restoration that's being done at San Diego Lagoon in Del Mar. There'll be a separate public workshop for it next month. I believe it's May 9th next month in Del Mar. Um, and so I would encourage you all to attend that if you have um, interest in that project as well. Um, with that, I just wanted to, this is a reminder to myself, to uh, all of those of you who are participating online, that um, you'll, the people that are uh, joining virtually will have um, their microphones muted and their video disabled. And you'll be able to ask a question by using the raise the hand function in the menu of your, your Zoom um, toolbar. Um, once you raise your hand, you'll be placed in an online questions queue in the order that your hand's raised. And then when it's your turn, um, you'll be able to ask your question and you'll see a prompt and, and uh, you'll need to unmute your microphone. <clears throat> so with that then, I just want to get started then um, with a little history of the project. Um, when uh, units two and three, songs units two and three were operating, they were cooled by a single pass seawater cooling system that um, each unit had its own cooling system. It consisted of a, a, a large intake pipe that was 18 feet in diameter that's shown in the top right-hand slide there, a slide back in the early 80s. There's a 1980s van there for, for reference. Those intake pipes were located about 3,000 feet offshore and about 30 feet of water. Each intake pipe collectively, the two of them together, would brought in a volume of water that was about 2.4 billion gallons a day. That volume of water is roughly equivalent to a cube about a square mile by 12 feet deep. So a lot of water went into this, uh, goes into the power plant to cool the nuclear reactors. That water gets heated about, I think it was about 19 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient, and then it gets discharged back into the ocean through two different um, discharge lines. Those lines extended uh, 6,000 and 8,000 feet offshore. Um, the last 2,500 feet of those discharge lines contain 63 diffuser ports, and those diffuser ports were intended to dissipate the uh, uh, hot uh, water up and to mix it with the surrounding um, seawater to kind of uh, cool it down. Okay, so there was a lot of concern um, during the planning stages of units two and three that um, the large volume of water used in the intake would cause significant marine impacts. So the California Coastal Commission commissioned a committee called the Marine Review Committee to conduct a lot of studies in the mid-1970s and 1980s to try to determine what the impacts of the power plant were. And if they determined there were impacts, then how to go about to minimize those impacts or to mitigate those impacts. And what the Marine Review Committee determined was they determined that um, the discharge system actually caused a substantial loss in the kelp force that was located right offshore of the power plant called the San Onofre kelp force. And that, that was due to the turbidity plume that was caused by all the mixing um, of the seawater that came out of the diffusers. And that turbidity plume drifted over the kelp force and it didn't actually kill adult plants, but it reduced light on the bottom and, and that reduced the, the number of small juvenile plants that actually could grow. So, so with that in mind, the Coastal Commission then, um, those types of impacts um, uh, are required by law by the Coastal Act to be mitigated. And the California Coastal Commission is the agency that's responsible for implementing the Coastal Act. 
And so what the Coastal Commission required Southern California Edison and its partners to do to mitigate that was to build, construct an artificial reef that was large enough to support at least 28 tons of fish and 150 acres of medium to high density kelp forest habitat to compensate for the losses of not just the kelp and the fish, but also the associated invertebrates and other algae in the kelp forests. Now, another important condition that the commission required is that the evaluation of, of the artificial reef in terms of it meeting its goals needed to be evaluated um, by a long-term monitoring program that was done independent of Southern California Edison. And so that's where people like myself come in. Um, uh, that is being done through a contract with uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, this is our monitoring team. It consists of six uh, project investigators that work in varying capacities on this project. We have a very dedicated and competent staff of a uh, um, uh, that. Uh, 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 research uh, biologists that actually do uh, most of the data collection and, and data management, um, whereas the investigators kind of oversee and direct the project. We have a science advisory panel consisting of Professor Rich Ambrose from UCLA, Professor Peter Mundy from UC Santa Cruz, and Professor Rush Schmidt from UC Santa Barbara. And I should say that this, the, our monitoring team here um, works on not just the artificial reef, but the wetland restoration project as well, okay? And the important point here is that um, we answer directly to the California Coastal Commission rather than Southern California Edison. The funding comes from Southern California Edison for this project, but um, our monitoring is done under the direction of the Coastal Commission. We have Dr. Rachel um, Pouch, who's a, a ecologist with the Coastal Commission here today. We have members of Southern California Edison that are here today. Um, so there's a lot of uh, collective knowledge and expertise and we're all here to answer whatever questions you have concerning the project today. Okay, so the objective is, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but it's to replace the marine resources that were damaged or lost in the San Onofre kelp forest due to the operations of songs units two and three. And the approach then was to design this artificial reef in sandy habitat. It's intended to be designed as a low relief reef with a topography and depth that's similar to that of the San Onofre kelp forest, which is the kelp forest that was damaged by the power plant. Um, the artificial reef was to be located near songs, near the power plant, but outside of its influence. And the reason for that was the idea was to replace the resources as close as possible to where they were being launched. Um, the artificial reef, there, were, there was a lot of um, uh, unknowns about how to build an artificial reef that would support a kelp form. So the decision was made to build the artificial reef in two phases. The first phase would be a small um, experimental phase that consisting of about 25 acres. It was only studied for a period of five years with the idea that um, uh, the information from that experiment would then be used to build out um, a larger phase reef that would be large enough, at least 150 acres or more, to compensate for um, the losses that were being incurred by the power plant. Um, uh, the artificial reef, another important part of this approach was that it, artificial reef had to be monitored to uh, uh, a determinate success, and that success is based on uh, a group of different types of performance standards, okay? And, and that's just to ensure that um, those standards are kind of used as a measuring stick to ensure that the objectives are being made or being met. And then lastly, um, uh, that if, if the monitoring showed that those standards weren't being met, then the uh, Edison would be required to actually fix the read, to correct the measured midi or to uh, remediate the problems in a way that the, the artificial reef was on a trajectory to success. And then lastly, the project monitoring and oversight would end when the mitigation requirements met. And the mitigation requirement in this um, particular project is that um, while the, the power plant's no longer producing um, energy, it produced energy for a period of roughly about 32 years. And so all the while those impacts were happening. So the mitigation, the project uh, and monitoring would end when that 32 years of uh, credit for, for those impacts had been um, uh, uh, achieved. 
Okay, so this uh, uh, map here shows where the artificial reef is located. Um, uh, phase one uh, is shown in these purple squares here. Those There's 56 of those squares. They're 40 meters by 40 meters on a side. Um, they're arranged in um, seven blocks or groups of eight different modules. They extend from close to San uh, Mateo Point up past the San Clemente Pier. Um, they were built in 1999. Um, there's about 25 acres there. Uh, phase two, which was built in 2008, um, consists of 18 irregular shaped polygons that are shown in green here. Um, it encompassed an area of about 150 um, acres. It consists of uh, quarry rock boulders that cover roughly about 42% of the bottom. And this stretches about three and a half kilometers, which I think is about a little over two miles long along the coast. Well, the monitoring of this project, seven years of it from 2009 to about 2000. 15 or so showed that the 175 acre Wheeler North Reef, this phase one and two combined, was just too small to consistently meet performance standards for fish standing stock and kelp area. So in 2016, the Coastal Commission required Southern California Edison and its partners to remediate the Wheeler North Reef by adding up to 210 new acres of low relief reef. And we refer to that as the phase three reef. So this is a map that shows the phase three reef as the white polygons. There's 20 of them, and again, an irregular shape. Um, there's a few of them located on the inshore downpost portion of the phase one and two, but the vast majority of it extends up coast of the phase two and uh, phase one reefs. Um, uh, collectively, uh, it was 198 acres that were constructed in the summers of 2019 and 2020. Um, collectively, all three phases uh, encompass 373 acres, um, in which uh, about 45% on average of the bottom is covered with rock and extends uh, along seven kilometers, about four and a half miles of coastline. Um, well, um, at the time that the phase three reef went in, there was actually a change in the way that mitigation credit is assigned for the performance of the Weaver North Reef with respect to two important standards. There's a, a, a standard for a kelp area that requires that the artificial reef sustain at least 150 acres of medium to high density adult kelp. And there's another standard that requires um, the fish standing stock on the reef to support to uh, amount to 28 tons of fish. And these, the way that these standards were set up initially is both of these standards had to be met in a given year for the Wheeler North Reef to receive mitigation credit for that year. And what that meant was if one of these standards failed, say the artificial reef only produced 150 acres of kelp and say 50 tons of fish, the Wheeler North Reef wouldn't have got any credit. It wouldn't have got any credit if it produced zero fish and zero kelp, or if it produced 149 acres of fish and 27 tons of kelp. And so when the expansion reef went in to, to increase the size to 383, the Coastal Commission changed that requirement to allow the artificial reef to get credit for every acre of kelp it produced and every um, uh, ton of fish that it supported. And the way it does that, it adds the number of acres of kelp and the, and the amount of tons the reef produces in each year and accumulates it over time. And the requirement is for these is met when the target amount for each of these two standards, in this case, 150 acres of kelp, 28 tons of fish, multiplied the, by the duration that the power plant was operating, which is 32 years, when the product of that um, is uh, when the cumulative total matches that product, then that mitigation, those mitigation requirements are fulfilled. Okay, oh, sorry, there's the revised method. Sorry about that. You can, so, okay. Um, and so um, this uh, tells a little bit about the performance monitoring. Again, the purpose was to determine whether or not the Real or North Reef was meeting its uh, required project goals. Again, we determine these goals based on a set of performance standards. This shows we have 151 sampling stations at Wheeler North Reef that are 
defined by a 50 meter by 20 meter area. Those stations are shown, if you can make it out, there's some little black lines and all these different polygons. It shows the location of these stations. They're spread out among the three phases of the artificial reef. Um, similarly, we use reference reefs for some of our standards and there's 82 stations at each of those two reference reefs. Each station is defined by a differential uh, GPS coordinate and a compass heading and Every station is sampled once a year during the summer and fall. <clears throat> Our sampling design consists of that uh, 50 meter transect line and we use different types of sampling units to sample different types of organisms. Fish are sampled in a three meter wide swath along the length of that 50 meter transect line and we sample fish up towards a meter and a half off the bottom. Um, Larger algae, uh, kelp, and some of the larger invertebrates are sampled in a, a 10 meter by a two meter um, band that run perpendicular to the main transect line. There's five of those and they're uniformly spaced along the transect. Um, within each of those, there's a one square meter plot um, and we use a point contact method of 20 uniform points where we estimate the percent cover of different types of uh, understory algae and sessile invertebrates. We also count either within the full one meter square or half of that one meter square, we count many uh, smaller invertebrates um, in these quadrats. Okay, um, the, if you were to dive on the artificial reef, you'd see that the types of organisms that are there really resemble what you see on a natural reef. These are just some photographs that show some of the more charismatic. Um, Species that we find on the reef, you see that there's sand bass and kelp bass are very abundant fish on the reef. Um, spiny lobster, which is uh, both commercially and recreationally important, is, is quite abundant on the Wheeler North Reef relative to other reefs in the region. And we also get um, giant sea bass, which is the largest bony fish in kelp forest. These reach upwards of 500 pounds, five feet long. They were um, basically hunted to near extinction in the 1950s and 60s. They've been making a comeback and they're very, they're common visitors to Wheeler North Reef in the surrounding area. Um, I just kind of in closing, I just wanna say that we have a, uh, a fairly comprehensive website where you can go on and find out a lot of information about the project, both the artificial reef and wetland project. There's um, a lot of background information. We have a library with a lot of documents. We have data ports. The library is something you can actually uh, browse and, and, um, and search by different types of categories. You can search by the type of project. You can search by who wrote the reports. Um, and you can search by different types of reports. We have things like annual reports. We have contractor reports, um, uh, construction reports that Edison has produced on the reef. We have permit uh, documents that the California Coastal Commission has developed for this project. We also have annotated versions of all the public workshops that we give. So this particular workshop, if, if you want to look it up, it'll be in our in our library. Um, we also have a data portal. We take a lot of pride and effort into um, uh, making sure our data are the highest quality and they're very well documented. The data are housed in a um, a uh, data repository that's funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. It's called the Environmental Data Initiative. Um, and, and you can uh, go to our website and you can search our data sets by different, again, different types of habitats, different types of data sets, um, various categories of data that we have. You can also find our data directly if you go to the data portal of the Environmental Data Initiative. Um, and lastly, um, if you go to the homepage of our website, um, you can sign up uh, to be on our mailing list and receive updates of whatever. You can follow us on social media. We have in the about section, we have uh, information on all the people involved in the project with all of our contacts and stuff. So um, we're trying to make it easy for you to reach out to us. And, um, and yeah, so we would encourage you to look at the, the website. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. If no questions, we can move on to the next talk. Okay, so let's move on to the next talk. And you are actually going to hear something other than just me blathering about the history. You'll hear about how the, the project has actually been doing the last year or so. So with that, um, Rachel Smith. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rachel Smith, and I'm an assistant researcher with the Songs Mitigation Monitoring Program, and I'm excited to share the 2023 monitoring results about the performance of Wheeler North Reef. And so as Dan mentioned, the goal of Wheeler North Reef was to compensate for the loss of kelp habitat that was caused by the operations of Songs, and the Songs Coastal Development Permit requires the use of different types of performance standards in order to evaluate whether that goal has been met. And so there's three main types of performance standards that I'm going to talk about today that are used to judge the success of Wheeler North Reef. And so these include um, relative performance standards that require Wheeler North Reef to be similar to reference sites every year. And then there's two types of absolute performance standards that are measured at Wheeler North Reef only. And so those include standards that must be met every year, and then also standards that accumulate mitigation credit over time until a required value is met. And that required value is based on the estimated losses that occurred at the San Onofre kelp forest that were caused by Songs operations. And so in this talk, we're gonna go through each of these different types of standards, beginning with those relative performance standards. And so evaluating the relative performance standards requires comparison of Wheeler North Reef to natural reference reefs. And in order to be successful, Wheeler North Reef must sustain a kelp forest community that's similar to those of natural reference reefs within the region. And so the nearby kelp forests at San Mateo and Barron were selected as reference reefs because they met the following criteria. They had a history of sustaining giant kelp. They occurred at a depth that's similar to Wheeler North Reef. They were primarily low relief reefs that consisted of cobbles and boulders, and they were located within the local region, but they were not affected by songs operations. And so in this project, we define similarities such that the four-year running average for the relative performance standard at Wheeler North Reef must not be significantly less than that of the reference reef that has the lowest value for that performance standard. And so for a given performance standard, Wheeler North Reef should perform at least as well as the lowest performing reference reef. And so the, because the biological characteristics vary from year to year, we use a four-year running average of each performance standard to help account for that variability. And so shown here are the 12 relative performance standards that are used to evaluate the performance of Wheeler North Reef. And so standards one through five are about the benthic community of macroalgae and invertebrates. Standards six through 10 are about reef fishes. And then standard 11 assesses how the benthic community supplies food for those reef fishes. And then the last standard 12 relates to undesirable and invasive species and assesses potential impairment of important reef functions. Oh, sorry, I should have been showing these. <laughs> okay. And so because the reef community of natural kelp forests varies over time, it's likely that a natural reef wouldn't consistently meet the relative for all relative performance standards in a given year. And so to avoid requiring Wheeler North Reef to perform better than the reference reefs, Wheeler North Reef is required to meet only as many of the relative performance standards as the lowest performing reference reef in a given year for that year to count towards mitigation credit. And the only exception to this is the performance standard for undesirable and invasive species, which is required to be met every year. And so this approach achieves the desired goal of Wheeler North Reef being similar to the natural reefs without requiring it to consistently outperform them. And so to assess performance, we evaluate Wheeler North Reef and the reference reefs well relative to one another to determine whether they eat, meet each relative performance standard. And then we tally the total number of relative performance standards that are met for, by each reef. Again, that excludes the undesirable and invasive species standards. And then we compare the totals. And we just wanted to flag that in 2020, uh, university-sponsored research was shut down from March to July, and so that caused a large reduction in our sampling effort for that year. And so as a result, we're excluding the 2020 data um, from the four-year running average that we used to evaluate the standards for 2023. So that means that the running average um, for 2023 is based on data that's only collected in 2021, 2022, and 2023. And so before we dive into the results for each relative performance standard, I just wanted to give an overview of how we're going to present the results using percent cover macroalgae as an example. And so in the following slides, the different reefs will be represented by different colors. So Wheeler North Reef will be in green, green triangles, or it will be in blue um, with squares, and San Mateo will be in red circles. And so in each side, slide, the left figure will show the annual time series since 2009, and the right figure will, will be a bar graph that shows the three-year running average for 2023. 
And so now we can start to dig into those results, looking at both macroalgae hover and species number. And so on the left, the annual time series shows that the percent hover and number of species of macroalgae at Woolen North Reef has generally been lower than that of the nearby reference reefs over time. And so there are some exceptions to that pattern for macroalgae species cover, um, for example, in 2009, just after the reef was constructed, and then also in 2021 and 2022, when the number of algal species at Wheeler North Reef was similar to San Mateo. And then in 2023, the three-year averages for both macroalgae, co macro algae cover and species number at Wheeler North Reef were significantly lower than either of the reference reefs. So Wheeler North Reef failed both of these performance standards in 2023. This slide is showing the results for sessile invertebrate cover, and sessile invertebrates um, compete with space for macroalgae on the reef, and they filter plankton from the water column. And the percent cover of sessile invertebrates varied substantially at all three reefs from 2009 to 2017, but it's been relatively constant since then. And the average cover of sessile invertebrates at Wheeler North Reef and Barn have been nearly identical for the last three years, and Wheeler North Reef passed the standard for 2023. Now we're moving on to mobile invertebrates, which include a range of grazers and predators that feed on reef-associated macroalgae, uh, detritus, and other invertebrates. And so with the exception of the first two years of this time series, uh, mobile invertebrate density at Wheeler North Reef has consistently been within or above the range of the reference reefs. And the three-year running average shows that Wheeler North Reef passed the standard in 2023. And so this slide shows the results for invertebrate species number, which includes both those sessile and mobile invertebrate species. And since 2012, the number of species of reef invertebrates at Wheeler North Reef has been within the range of values measured at the reference reefs. And the three-year running average of the number of species of invertebrates was nearly identical among the three reefs and Wheeler North Reef passed the standard in 2023. Now we're moving on to those fish performance standards, beginning with the density of resident fishes, which are greater than one year old. And densities of resident fish at all three reefs have remained relatively stable throughout the time series, with greater abundances at Wheeler North Reef and Barn in San Mateo over the last nine years. And the three-year running average shows that Wheeler North Reef passed this performance standard in 2023. Now we're showing the results for densities of young of year or goy fish, which are smaller fish that were born within the current year. And yoy fish densities at Wheeler North Reef have consistently been within or above the range of the reference reefs throughout the time series. And so yoy densities fluctuated at all three reefs until 2016, when they declined dramatically at all reefs. And then beginning in 2021, there has been an increasing trend in yoy abundance at Wheeler North Reef. And so the three-year running average shows that Wheeler North Reef passed the standard in 2023. Now we're showing the results for fish species number. And so fish species number at Wheeler North Reef, again, has consistently been within or above the range of the reference reefs, uh, with Wheeler North Reef generally having greater number of fish species than San Mateo, but fewer than barn. And the three-year running average shows that Wheeler North Reef passed the standard in 2023. So now we're moving on to the fish production standard, which represents the amount of biomass produced per unit area in a given year. And so this standard incorporates both somatic growth, which is estimated from annual rings in fish ear bones, and also gonadal growth, which is measured as a production of reproductive tissue. And so we measure those both types of growth in five fish indicator species that represent the most common fish species in kelp forests, and they represent fish from different feeding guilds that use the reef in different ways. And so at all of the reefs, fish production has been relatively constant over time, aside from high fish production year in 2011 at Farm. And fish production at Wheeler North Reef has consistently been within or above the range of the reference reefs. And the three-year running average shows that Wheeler North Reef uh, passed this standard in 2023. Now we're showing the results for fish reproductive rate. And here we calculate the fecundity index as a mean of the annual egg production scaled to female fish size averaged across three fish indicator species. And so the mean fecundity index has varied across time for all of the reefs over the time series without any consistent trends among the reefs. And the three year running average was statistically similar at all three reefs. So we learned our reef passed this performance standard in 2023. And then 
Now we're showing the results for fish food chain support, which again requires that the benefit community of Wheeling Earth Reef provide food for the reef fishes. And we evaluate this performance standard by measuring the weight of the gut contents of two common fish species that feed on the reef. And then we scale those measurements to the weight of the fish to then calculate this index of food chain support. And so food chain support has been relatively constant and similar at all three reefs throughout the time series. And the three-year running average was statistically similar at all three reefs and Wheeler North Reef passed this performance standard in 2023. So now our last relative performance standard is for undesirable and invasive species. And this standard must be met every year on Wheel and Reef Reef. And it requires that the important functions of the reef not be impaired by undesirable or invasive benthic species. And so native species can become undesirable if they become so abundant that they impair important reef functions. And so two examples of this are dense aggregations of sea fans that can monopolize space on the reef and exclude other species like giant kelp or high densities of sea urchins that can intensively graze the bottom and create large deforested areas that are known as urchin barrens. Invasive species are non-native species that become abundant and can displace native species or otherwise harm important reef functions. And so two non-native species that are known to be invasive in Southern California reefs are the brown al algae uh, Sargassum horneri or the Bryozoan water sephora subatra. And so primary production by giant kelp and secondary production are by reef fishes are two of the important functions of the reef that we use to evaluate this standard. And so the method that we use to evaluate impairment of reef function by undesirable invasive species is a three-step process. So first we measure the abundances of undesirable and invasive species at Wheeler North Reef relative to the reference reefs to determine their potential to impair important reef functions. Then we compare the production of giant kelp and fish um, production at Wheeler North relative to the reference reefs to determine whether those functions at Wheeler North Reef are underperforming relative to the reference reefs. And lastly, if the production of giant kelp or fish at Wheeler North Reef is underperforming, then we would complete additional studies or analyses to determine whether that underperformance is caused by impairment from undesirable and invasive species. And so for 2023, we're going to begin evaluating this performance standard, starting with step one, by looking at the abundance of undesirable and invasive species. And so this shows a time series of the three reefs, beginning with percent cover of sea fans. You can see that the percent cover of sea fans has been increasing more at Wheeling North Reef compared to the reference reefs, particularly over the last few years, which does raise a potential concern for impairment of important reef functions by sea fans. Now looking at the density of sea urchins, we see that the average density of sea urchins at Wheeling North Reef has remained relatively low, um, ranging from zero to about one per meter squared. And this density is far below the threshold of 20 to 30 sea urchins per meter squared that's known to convert kelp forests into urchin barrens. So therefore there's very little concern at this time that, we, that sea urchins are impairing important functions at Wheeler North Reef. And lastly, in 2023, no invasive non-native algae or invertebrates were observed at Wheeler North Reef. So there's no concern that invasive species are impairing the important reef functions at this time. However, given that potential concern about sea fans at Wheeler North Reef, we're moving to step two, which evaluates whether those aggregations of sea fans are impairing the production of giant kelp and fish at Wheeler North Reef. And so beginning with giant kelp primary production, we found that this important reef function at Wheeler North Reef has consistently remained um, within or above the range of the reference reef since 2010. Similarly, looking at fish secondary production, reef fish production at Wheeler North Reef has also consistently been within um, the range of the reference reefs throughout the time series. And so for both functions, the values for Wheeler North Reef were within the range of the reference reefs for 2023. And so we conclude from those analyses that there's no compelling evidence that undesirable native species or invasive non-native species impaired important reef functions at Wheeler North Reef in 2023. And Wheeler North Reef met the performance standard for undesirable and invasive species for this year. However, due to their relatively high abundance, we're going to continue closely monitoring sea fans and their potential impact on primary production of giant kelp and secondary production of reef fish. So this slide summarizes the number of relative performance standards that were met by Wheeler North Reef and the two reference reefs in 2023. 
And so you can see that Wheeler North Reef met nine of the 11 relative performance standards in 2023 compared to nine standards met by Barn and seven standards met by San Mateo, which was the lowest performing reference reef. So Wheeler North Reef met some more standards than that lowest performing reference reef. Also, Wheeler North Reef, as we just mentioned, met the standard for undesirable and invasive species. And so based on those results, we include that the ecological resources and functions provided by Wheeler North Reef in 2023 were similar to those provided by nearby natural reefs. And so Wheeler North Reef met the collective mitigation requirement for the relative performance standards for 2023. So now we're going to move on to those other types of performance standards, the absolute performance standards, um, beginning, and again, we measure those only at Wheeler North Reef. And so we're gonna begin with hard substrate, which is the one absolute performance standard that must be met every year for Wheeler North Reef to achieve mitigation credit. And so this standard requires that at least 90% of the exposed hard substrate remain available for attachment by reef biota. And we evaluate the standard based on the value um, measured for the current year or the four year running average, whichever one is higher. And so this slide gives an overview of the method that we use to evaluate um, hard substrate. And so we use multi-beam sonar, measures the combined footprint area of phase one and two of the Illinois North Reef once every five years. And then every year divers will estimate the percent cover of exposed rock on transects distributed across phase one and two of Wheeler North Reef. And so divers collect the percent cover data that's um, in the bottom right hand corner um, for nine different types of categories of substrate and the top five that are in the green box are those that are used in the analysis of hard substrate. And so then we use that footprint area um, multiplied by that percent cover of exposed hard rock rock to calculate the area of his exposed rock. And we compare that estimate to that that was obtained immediately after the construction of the phase two of Wheeler North Reef. And then we can use that to determine whether 90% or more is still available for reef biota. And so this slide shows the annual time series of the total area of exposed hard substrate at Wheeler North Reef on the left, and then the three-year running average on the right. And both plots have a line um, for the as-built, which is the solid line, and then the dashed line is 90% of it, that initial area of, of as-built. And so you can see from the annual time series that at least 90% of the initial area of um, exposed hard substrate on Mueller North Reef has remained available every year since phase two was constructed. And some of those annual values that you see that are above the asphalt lines likely reflect either scouring or redistribution of reef material. And so on the right, the three-year average at Wheeler North Reef was greater than that asphalt condition. And so Wheeler North Reef passed that performance standard in 2023. So now we're moving on to our last type of performance standard, the absolute performance standards that accumulate partial mitigation credit each year. And so Dan already describes this a little bit in the first talk, but they include the standards for giant kelp area and fish standing stock. And so the intent of the performance standard for giant kelp was that Wheeler North Reef sustain 150 acres of medium to high density giant kelp for a time period that equaled to the operating life of songs. And similarly, the intent of the performance standard for fish standing stock was that Wheeler North Reef sustain a fish standing stock of at least 28 tons um, for a time period that was also equal to that operating life. And so mitigation credit for both of those standards is summed over time until the accumulated credit for each performance standard reaches the total value equivalent to the annual target multiplied by the number of years of SOMS operations, which the Coastal Commission determined to be 32 years. And the Coastal Commission also determined that kelp acreage and fish standing stock would begin accumulating credit in 2019. And so this slide gives an overview of how we evaluate the standard for giant kelp. And so we measure the density of giant kelp in 151 fixed transects that are spread across all three phases of Wheeler North Reef. And we define medium to high density kelp as um, more, more than four adults per 100 meters squared. And we define adults as individuals with more than seven fronds. And so using this data, we then calculate the proportion of transects at Wheeler North Reef that had more than four adult kelp plants per 100 meters squared. And then to obtain the total acreage of kelp at Wheeler North Reef, we multiply that proportion by 373 acres, which again is the combined footprint area of all three phases of the reef using um, those most recent sonar surveys. 
And so these plots show the results for the cumulative absolute standard for giant kelp. So on the left, we have an annual time series beginning in 2019 of um, the acres of giant kelp. And in 2023, Wheeler North Reef earned 65 acres of credit for supporting medium to high density kelp. And then on the right, we see the cumulative kelp acreage over time. And so when added to the previous years, Wheeler North Reef has accumulated 229 acres of the 4,800 acres of medium to high density kelp that are required. And so notably looking at the plot on the left, we see that the area of medium to high density kelp uh, Wheeler North Reef has been well below that 150 acre design target, um, which could be a reason for concern. And so we wanted to compare the time series for adult giant kelp at Wheeler North Reef to the two natural reference reefs to assess whether that low kelp acreage is specific to Wheeler North Reef or part of a regional pattern. And so the data plotted in this graph show that since 10, 2010, Wheeler North Reef has typically supported as much or more kelp um, as the two reference reef. And so the general decline that we observed at Wheeler North Reef since 2017 was also observed at Barn Kelp and San Mateo, with the exception that Barn did show um, a brief increase in 2021, though it did decline close to zero for 2022 and 2023. So these results indicate that the low kelp acreage at Wheeler North Reef is not specific to Wheeler North Reef and is likely part of a regional pattern. So now we're moving on to that second absolute standard that does accumulate credit over time, which is fish standing stock. And so we calculate fish standing stock using fish density and length data that we collect from 151 transects that are spread across all three phases of Wheeler North Reef. And we use known relationships between length and weight for each species to estimate the weights of the fish counted. And then all of the weights that are counted on a transect are summed to obtain an estimate of fish biomass density for each transect. And then we use those transect level estimates of fish biomass to scale up to the 373 acre footprint of Wheeler North Reef to estimate fish standing stock. And so again, these plots show the results for fish standing stock and the left plot shows the annual fish standing stock on Wheeler North Reef since, 20, um, since 2019. And in 2023, Wheeler North Reef earned 35 tons of credit for its fish standing stock, which is above that 28 um, ton design target. And then the plot on the right shows the cumulative fish standing stock over time. And so when added to the prior years, Wheeler North Reef has accumulated 129 of the 896 tons of fish standing stock that are required for the standard. And so for some additional context, the biomass density of fish at Wheeler North Reef has been consistently within the range of the nearby natural reefs. And in general, fish biomass at Wheeler North Reef has been lower than barn, but higher than San Mateo over time. And so for the relative performance standards and the absolute performance standard that must be met every year, one year of mitigation credit is given for each year that Wheeler North Reef meets both types of those performance standards. And the mitigation requirement is then fulfilled when the number of years of mitigation credit accrued by Wheeler North Reef equals the total years of operation of songs, which again is 32 years. In contrast, the absolute performance standards for giant kelp area and fish standing stock accrue partial mitigation credit over time. And so giant kelp and fish standing stock are evaluated separately and assigned um, mitigation credit independently. And so the mitigation requirements for these performance standards are fulfilled when the total amount of credit accrued equals the targeted annual value um, multiplied by the total years of SONS operations. And so here we're going to summarize the credit for both of these types of standards. And so Wheeler North Reef earned one year of credit in 2023 for meeting the collective group of relative standards and also the absolute standard for hard substrate. And overall, the reef has earned five years of mitigation credit for these performance standards, and it needs another 27 years of credit for this um, mitigation requirement to be met. And for the performance standards that accumulate credit over time, in 2023, Wheeler North Reef earned credit for 65 acres of giant kelp for a cumulative total of 229 acres out of the 4,800 acres that are required. So an additional 4,571 acres is needed to meet the standard. And then in 2023, Wheeler North Reef earned credit for 35 tons of fish standing stock for a cumulative credit of 129 tons. And the reef needs to earn an additional 767 tons of fish before the mitigation requirement for fish standing stock is met. 
So there are provisions in the Songs Coastal Development Permit to reduce monitoring to annual site inspections once we learn North Reef has demonstrated that it's successfully met the performance standards. And specifically, Condition C of the permit states that after 10 years of monitoring that demonstrate that the artificial reef has been meeting the performance standards, monitoring can be reduced to annual site inspections that serve to identify any non-compliance with the performance standards. Furthermore, Condition D states that monitoring can be scaled down after all the performance standards have been met each year for a three-year period. And so Wheeler North Reef has been monitored for more than 10 years and has met all of the performance standards for more than three consecutive years. So therefore, we are going to begin annual site inspections in 2024. And so the approach that we're using to assess similarity for the relative performance standards during annual site inspections will differ from what we currently use for the full monitoring approach. And so our full monitoring approach uses inferential statistics to compare relative performance standards to determine whether Wheeler North Reef is similar to the reference reefs. And the sampling effort of the relative performance standards was designed in order to detect a 20% difference between the reefs with 80% of statistical power. Um, in contrast, our approach for annual site inspections will just will compare mean values of the relative performance standards without inferential statistics to determine whether we learn with reef is similar to the reference reef. And this approach is based on our past knowledge of performance since 2009. And the sampling effort of the relative performance standard was designed to identify any non-compliance with the performance standards, but again, the substantially reduced monitoring and associated costs. So this table shows the comparison of sampling effort between the full monitoring and the reduced monitoring approach that was developed for annual site inspections for those relative performance standards. And so for nine of the relative standards that we currently collect on transects, sampling will be reduced from 82 to 15 transects, which is an 82% reduction. Um, the undesirable and invasive species standard will be reduced from 151 to 111 transects on the Wheeler North Reef and from 82 to 15 transects on the reference reefs, which is a collective 55% reduction. For the relative standard that's currently collected with fish collections, for fish production, we're no longer going to incorporate fish collections under reduced sampling, and instead we're going to use fish biomass density, which is measured on transects as a proxy, so that represents a 100% reduction. And then for fish reproduction and fish food chain support, we, were, we will reduce the number of individuals and the number of species sampled, or fish collected, which represents a 75% reduction for fish reproduction and a 50% reduction for fish food chain support. And so to assess the chosen approach for annual site inspections, we used historic data collected from 2009 to 2021 to compare reef level outcomes for 11 of the relative performance standards using both the full monitoring and the reduced monitoring approaches. And again, we didn't include the relative standard for undesirable and invasive species because in this analysis, because it must be met every year for Wheeler North Reef to receive mitigation credit for that year. So the numbers in the columns are the number of performance standards that were passed by a, year, a reef in a given year for both full monitoring on the left and reduced monitoring on the right. And so red numbers mean that the reef was the lowest performer for that year, whereas green numbers mean that a reef was not the lowest performer for that year. And so then the bottom row sums up the number of years that a reef was deemed not to be the lowest using both full and reduced sampling. So overall, you can see that the estimates of similarity that were based on reduced monitoring were comparable to those that were based on full monitoring. And so this change to annual site inspections for evaluating the relative performance standards also provided an opportunity for us to reduce the sampling effort for those absolute standards. And that reduction is most easily accomplished by eliminating one of the transects in each of the 40 pairs of transects that are used to sample phase two of Wheeler North Reef. And so this table shows a comparison of the sampling effort between full monitoring and the reduced monitoring approach for the absolute performance standards, which are all collected on transects. And so for the hard substrate standard, sampling will be reduced from 82 to 47 transects, which is a 43% reduction. And then for the kelp area and fish standing stock standards, sampling will be reduced from 151 to 111 transects, which is a 26% reduction. And so these two figures show the time series of those absolute performance standards for adult kelp area and fish standing stock that are calculated with transects for both full monitoring, which are shown in the black circles, and reduced monitoring, which is shown in the open circles. And estimates of both standards are based on 
you can see that the, the, those standard the, those estimates based on reduced monitoring were comparable to those um, based on full monitoring. And so moving forward, reduced monitoring for annual site inspections is set to begin in 2024, and the project will return to full monitoring if Wheeler North Reef fails to meet as many relative performance standards as the lowest performing reference reef, and the reason for Wheeler North Reef's failure is not associated with reduced monitoring. And so thank you for listening, and we're happy to take any questions. There is a comment, not a question. Yes. This is from Chris Goldblatt. It says, thank you for building the largest and most successful biogenic reef in the world by submitters. The reef is a true nature forward legacy for mankind. The site that conducted by UCSD makes for ideal transfer of technology from the UC system to private and commercial operations which is the desired course, much like the Nobel winning new LED discovery at UCSD, it went on to be useful. Fishery Project recently deployed California's first CK reef off of Comita in front of UCSD. We look forward to doing our best to replicate the standard and procedures UCSD has set for the study of Willard R3 transfer technology for the benefit of building and studying the best possible biogenic reefs, making California a leader in this space. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Craig. <laughs> yeah, we're excited to see the reef doing so well. Yes. Um, how are we going to determine if it is lower to you know, the relative standards and whether it's because of the reduced standard? Great question. <laughs> and the pioneer of the method we're using is sitting right in front of you, Pete and Wendy. <laughs> um, we've developed a probability analysis that that will help us determine when there's too many standards that have been met, and it and also accumulates over time. So it's like you can meet a certain you can meet a certain number of stand, not meet a certain number of standards in one year, and then we'll know in the next year whether that hasn't been met. I'm butchering it. Pete, do you want to give a better explanation? <laughs> Yeah, what we did in the past. Yeah, speak up. Sorry. Sorry. What we did in the past was we used a statistical approach that would look at the likelihood that any single standard was significantly worse than the lowest reference. And then those would add up. And so, what we said in the beginning, what in there, during the normal course of sampling, was that if you had more of those losers, let's call them, than any other read, then you were. Not that. Now that we've gone to a different approach where we're doing more to sample, we are just saying we're going to count the number of losses without any specific whatsoever. And we're going to compare that to the lowest performing reference rate. If you're below that, then you don't get credit. The second part of it is the important part, which I think is where you're going, which is well, when do you know and when are you convinced that it's actually underperformed to the extent that you do one of two things? Ask for remediation or start start up again with that, the, uh, the original samples. And for that, we're just taking a probabilistic approach. So let's say that there are 12 standards, there are three reefs, then on average, every reef should be the lowest for four. But if you're lowest for five, is that really statistically important? You know, like it's flipping a coin. If you get two heads in a row, is that not going to run with a fair coin? Not so much. But you get three or four or five, and you get more and more convinced it's outside of the of a normal progression for fair coin. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying it's five, it's probably close enough, and it's six, and it's not probable. We actually capital the probability. And it's not until the probability becomes so remote, we're using what are we using regional? Point one. Point yeah, one that, that we would say we're going to invoke the next step, which would be go back to. Yeah, I know. Much more, more clearly explained. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, with that, we're going to hear from Dr. Kabahesh. Oh, wait, 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 I'm going to let you guys talk. Um, hi, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Very, very exciting to see it doing so well. 
Um, my question was uh, whether you observed similar patterns of colonization and succession on the phase three reef of what you saw on the phase two and phase one reefs. Yeah, I might let Dan speak to that because he's similar. Similar patterns of colonization and succession on the phase three reef versus the other reefs. Dan's dug a lot more into that phase three data. It depends what you're talking about. Um, when it comes to kelp, we saw similar spatial patterns in terms of how kelp colonized across the spatial extent of the Wheeler North Reef, but it colonized at much lower densities. Um, and part of that, we believe, has to do with the fact that kelp in the region at the time the phase three reef was colonized was much less abundant than it was when the phase one and two were colonized. When it comes to fish, my recollection is the trajectory of colonization of the fish, when in terms of certainly the biomass of phase three reef is on the same trajectory in terms of how that biomass is increasing over time as it did on the phase um, uh, one and two reefs. When it comes to everything else, I can't tell you because we don't measure everything else on the phase three reef. We only measure for the most part, um, kelp and fish on the phase three reef because they were built specifically to augment the reef to meet the kelp and fish standards. Did that answer your question, Nate? Yeah, thanks. All right. Great, then we're gonna bring up Dr. Kapaheshti to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned from the last 24 years of monitoring at Wheeler Reef. Okay, great. So like Rachel mentioned, this talk reviews lessons learned from over or from 24 years of monitoring on Wheeler Moon Reef. Before we jump into those lessons learned, we want to first acknowledge the unprecedented size and scope of the project as Wheeler North Reef is the largest artificial reef of its kind at 373 acres. It has been monitored over 24 years and co-monitored alongside two reference reefs. And like Rachel mentioned in uh, the talk that she just gave, we evaluate 15 performance standards annually for this monitoring program. And that averages around 650 dive hours that we are underwater to complete this work. And so as Rachel mentioned, we are now moving to annual site inspections. And so this seemed like a really opportune moment to evaluate or review all the lessons learned from this long-term mitigation monitoring program. Oops, I'm sorry. There's a map of all the reference rates. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so this talk is organized chronologically, starting first with the 25-acre experimental reef, which was constructed in 1999. Mitigate uh, monitoring began in 2000 and continues today at a reduced capacity with full monitoring of the experimental reef extending from 2000 to 2004. Then we'll move on to the 150 acre mitigation reef, which was constructed in 2008 and mitigation monitoring began from 2009 and continues today with plans for reduced monitoring in 2024. And then we will review or demonstrate how this long term monitoring data can be used to inform adaptive management or potential remedial action uh, using the 198 acre remediation reef as our example. And this reef, as Rachel and Dan mentioned, was built over a two year period from 2019 to 2020 and has been monitored since then with plans for reduced monitoring in 2024. Before we jump into the lessons learned from the experimental reef, I first want to provide a brief overview on the motivation for the experimental reef, which was uh, uh, really to address the unknown of how percent cover of hard substrate or substrate type might affect the colonization of fish and kelp on the artificial reef. In addition, there were concerns raised during the planning phase uh, uh, stages of the experimental reef regarding whether or not concrete, which was at the time the cheaper of the two material types considered, would perform similarly to rock, and whether kelp was capable of dispersing the three and a half kilometers necessary for natural kelp to for kelp to naturally colonize the entire artificial reef. And so the first phase of the reef, which is this experimental reef, was designed to address these unknowns. And it was organized, as Dan briefly mentioned in the intro, into seven blocks. Each of those blocks had eight modules. 
that were made of either rock or concrete with one of three nominal coverage types, either low, which was approximately 42%, medium, which was approximately 63%, uh, or high uh, cover of rock, which was around 86%. And then on a subset of the medium cover modules, kelp was outplanted. And so now that we're familiar with the design, we're gonna move on to the several unknowns that the experimental reef addressed. So first, do kelp and fish density vary by substrate cover or type? Address uncertainty regarding how to design an artificial reef that would support a kelp forest community while also meeting the project goals and objectives. And then the last two questions uh, address the unknowns related to the ecology of kelp colonization, which has really important implications uh, that could inform ongoing efforts of kelp restoration occurring in California and uh, globally, really. And so these two unknowns were first, how does kelp recruitment vary as a function of distance from source or put more simply, how far does kelp disperse? And then second, can outplanting be used to augment kelp, natural kelp recruitment if kelp recruitment is indeed limited? Kelp dispersal, sorry. So starting with the first unknown, do kelp, fish, kelp uh, and fish density vary by substrate type and cover? So plotted here on uh, the top is adult fish, uh, adult fish, adult kelp density for each of the three cover types represented by the different shapes. So again, it's low, medium, and high. First, we're plotting uh, concrete shown in, in white, and we're gonna overlay the rock data. And you can see that within a year, adult kelp density is comparable between uh, rock and concrete modules of similar cover types. And that generally, the higher the cover, the higher the adult kelp density. But most importantly, if we overlay the reference reef data, which is uh, shown here as this shaded ribbon, which represents the mean plus one standard error for the highest performing reef and the mean minus one standard error for the lowest performing reef in any given year, we see that the experimental reef, with the exception of that first year, has supported adult kelp densities either within or greater than that of the reference reefs. And plotted on the bottom here is fish biomass density, similar to what we saw on the top. So again, here's the concrete data over time, overlaying the rock data. And if we show the reference data on top of that, you see that generally the experimental reef for all cover types and substrate types is generally within or uh, above what we observe at the reference reefs. And so in general, all substrate types and covered covers tested were comparable on the experimental reef relative to reference reefs. And we did a similar exercise for the benthic community and understory algae, and those showed similar results. And so to summarize, the results from the experimental reef informed the design uh, uh, or set the design parameters with respect to substrate type and cover. So what that means is the reef could not be built below the cover that was tested, which was an average of 42% cover. That's what I mean by that. And so ultimately, given the higher environmental impact, mainly emissions and air quality associated with using concrete over rock and the increasing cost of concrete, Southern California Edison's uh, proposal that was later approved by the California Postal Commission was to construct a low relief uh, reef with relatively low cover averaging around 42%. And of, of, sorry, most important, of quarry rock. <laughs> okay. So next we will address the unknowns relevant to recent statewide investment and interest in kelp restoration. So first, how far does kelp disperse? So here we're showing kelp recruit density uh, in that first year following construction of the experimental reef across all seven of the blocks. And what you can see is that there is a lot of variability in recruit density within and among blocks. But we do see this general decrease that with increasing distance from San Mateo, we see a decrease in kelp recruit density. Now, this pattern of decreasing kelp density with increasing distance from San Mateo, which is the nearest source population that I showed in the previous slide, disappeared by year three due to density dependent thinning of plants uh, with on um, modules with high recruitment. And importantly, recruitment densities were sufficient on all the modules, even those farthest from San Mateo, to produce dense stands 
with surface canopies by year three, as shown by the near IR image on the right, um, that shows nearly every module being covered in surface canopy by year three. Okay, next we examined whether outplanting laboratory reared health embryos to the artificial reef can be used to augment natural health recruitment. So the photo on the top shows a recently installed uh, uh, kelp embryo on twine and what those outplants look like at, at sub sub subsequent monitoring dates. And the figure here shows the proportion of plates with kelp surviving at three and 11 months post installation. And you can see that almost a year following the installation of these outplants, majority of them were still there and surviving. And so, this is just one of many methods for outplanting kelp. That said, mimicking what nature does by outplanting takes a tremendous amount of effort. And in this case was not needed because as we showed in the previous slide, kelp rapidly uh, colonized the entire uh, stretch of the experimental reef. And this finding of widespread and rapid colonization of kelp on the experimental reef is important from a kelp restoration perspective because it suggests that these costly uh, and labor intensive interventions uh, aimed at seeding degraded populations in many cases might not be uh, necessary. And instead, kelp restoration efforts may be better served if they focus on ameliorating the stressors that degraded the population in the first place and allow for natural colonization and succession to uh, occur whenever possible. And so to summarize, kelp dispersal uh, was widespread across the experimental reef. Recruit density generally decreased with increasing distance from the source population, which in this case was San Mateo Reef. And even at low recruitment densities, we saw high uh, or dense canopies uh, within three years. And outplanting, while successful, uh, was not necessarily needed because we saw such widespread colonization that was sufficient to cover the entire reef. Okay, moving now to the lessons learned from mitigation monitoring, which as I mentioned, began in 2009 and continues today. There were several unknowns related to uh, the ecological dynamics of artificial reefs, and this included their propensity to support high densities of sea fans, which were shown by earlier studies to exclude kelp. Um, and this is a concern that's most relevant to Southern California. The other two listed unknowns were more applicable to artificial reefs more broadly in terms of uh, the extent to which artificial reefs produce new fish as opposed to only attract fish from nearby reefs and their ability to resemble natural reefs in the time frame for doing so. So beginning with our first question regarding sea fans. So during the impact assessment phase of uh, the Songs project, uh, Richard Ambrose and colleagues examined the propensity of sea fans to exclude giant kelp, and they did this by comparing the mean densities of sea fans and, and uh, 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 giant kelp frond densities, and what they found was that, oh sorry, so they did this across uh, uh, 10 artificial and 16 natural reefs, and what they found was that beyond a certain threshold, kelp frond densities dropped to zero, and that density was around 10 sea fans per meter squared. This is now referred to as the Ambrose line. And the figure, or the photo on the right shows an example of high sea fan densities on artificial reefs, here uh, using a photo from Pendleton Artificial, which is a, a nearby artificial reef relative to Willanar. And so this earlier work by Richard Ambrose and others suggested that sea fans were more likely to dominate high relief high cover reefs, and whereas low relief reefs were purported to have sufficient scour to reduce sea fan abundance. And so this line of thinking coupled with the desire to replace the resources lost at the San Onofre kelp forest, which was also a low relief reef, informed the design of the mitigation reef as a low relief, relatively low cover artificial reef. And uh, it was an example of a classic high relief artificial reef, again, is Pendleton artificial reef shown on the left and a low relief uh, reef being well, North Reef, 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 <laughs> shown on the right. And so uh, given this concern though, we wanted to explore whether or not sea fans exclude kelp on Wheel North Reef, which uh, Rachel already sort of, uh, addressed with her talk. So a little bit of a spoiler alert, but uh, the figure on the right shows 
see adult within density uh, over time on Wheeler North Reef shown as the blue triangles. And then again, the reference reef data is shown as that shaded ribbon. And we see that sea fan densities have been climbing on Wheeler North Reef beginning in 2010. Um, and we have indicated the Ambrose line for reference. And so given this increase in sea fan density, we want to explore whether or not they are excluding kelp. And so kelp frond density is the plot on the right. And this is uh, used because it's a good estimate of kelp biomass. And you can see that, first of all, we see this regional decline in kelp, uh, kelp frond density across all the reefs. And then also it's important to note that with the exception of 2009 and 2016, Wheeler North Reef has had either higher or within, uh, has supported kelp frond densities that are either above or within the range of the reference reefs since then. And so there's, while Wheeler North Reef supports high densities of sea fans, there's no evidence to su suggest that those sea fans are excluding giant kelp. Okay, next we're gonna uh, address the unknown uh, regarding attraction. So here, attraction refers to the re relocation of fish from a natural reef to the artificial reef. And this schematic here, represents on the left before the artificial reef was constructed and then on the right after the artificial reef was constructed and those fish that were there before the reef was constructed in the case of attraction they are just being redistributed and spread across the natural reef and the, and the artificial reef so there's not a new an addition or an increase in fish with the addition of the artificial reef whereas after construction of the artificial reef, there is an increase in fish biomass because the artificial reef is producing new reef fish. And um, given that this was such a big concern uh, during the early stages of the project, there's actually, like Rachel mentioned, there's a, a performance standard for fish production that's in the song's permit. And we evaluate this standard, which couples fish biomass density and somatic and gonadal growth across the five species listed uh, or shown here on the bottom. And so the arrival of adult fish on the artificial reef soon after construction would indicate attraction. And so if there was no attraction, then the expectation would be that no adult fish would be observed on the artificial reef. During that first year of monitoring though, we found strong evidence that Wheeler North Reef attracted fish from the nearby natural reefs. And we would, because if you, you can see here that we observed high densities of adult fish on Wheeler North Reef relative to the reference reefs, which had lower adult fish densities. Um, and so this is indicative of attraction in that first year. Fish production, uh, we see that it took about five years for fish production to reach the levels observed in, on the reference reefs, but since then has been within or above the range observed on the reference reefs. And so together, this just suggests that the artificial reef both produces and attracts new fishes. Okay, next uh, we're going to address uh, how long it takes Wheeler North Reef to resemble natural reefs. So plotted on the left is fish biomass density at Wheeler North Reef and the reference reefs. And you can see that over that time series, Wheeler North Reef has been within the range of the reference reefs, but this doesn't tell us anything about whether or not the fish community itself resembled that of the reference reefs. And so what we did is we looked at the first three years of monitoring data, and we looked at what is the community based off when we're looking at uh, the top species that contribute to the fish biomass on the three reefs. And so the contribution of the three reefs is represented by the different colors and the legends on the right. And you can see that Wheeler North Reef most closely resembles the community on San Mateo, which is the closer of the two reference reefs. And it is also similar to barn with the exception of a few individuals of giant sea bass that make up a relatively large proportion of the biomass on that reef. Now we wanted to see whether or not that species composition, similarity in, in species composition persisted over time. So we did the same exercise using the last three years of monitoring data and saw that similar to what we saw in the first few years, we learned North Reef is most similar to San Mateo. And across all three reefs, um, we see this uh, the contribution of giant sea bass uh, uh, to the proportion of total biomass on these three reefs has increased in these later years. Um, what was that thing I was going to say? Oh, it escaped me. Um, okay. All right. So um, next we have fish numerical density. And uh, we see that Wheeler North Reef has been within or above the range of the reference reefs since monitoring began. 
if we look at the first few, oh, I was, I know what I was saying. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say that these species represent the, uh, around 70 to 80% of the total biomass on the three So it's a huge proportion, right? Um, and so uh, when we look at the first three years of monitoring data for uh, uh, fish numerical density, we see that Wheeler North Reef similarly is most similar to the barn with the majority of uh, the community when looking at numerically abundant species is made up of black-eyed gobies. Uh, and when we do the same exercise using the last three years of monitoring, we see the black eye goby densities have gone down across all three reefs and other species like California sheephead and senorita have increased in abundance. But again, Wheeler North Reef is most similar to San Mateo in this case. We did the same exercise for mobile invertebrate density, and this is a little bit different than what we saw with the fish. Mobile invertebrate densities took a few years to reach levels that were compar comparable to the reference reefs. And if we look at the first three years of monitoring data, we see that the community of mobile invertebrates were most similar uh, on Wheeler North Reef and Varn. And if we, and it's, and uh, the brittle stars made up the majority of mobile invertebrates across all three reefs. And when we look at the last three years of monitoring, we see that brittle stars densities went down and uh, snail densities increased across all three reefs. And again, Wheeler North Reef with respect to mobile invertebrate densities is most similar to barn. Next, we're plotting sessile invertebrate cover, which by year two was within or above the range of the reference reefs. And when we look at the community, we see that uh, Wheeler North Reef is really similar to both of the reference reefs, um, but Wheeler North Reef did support higher cover of tunicates relative to the other two sites. Looking at the last three years of monitoring data, we see that again, there's a lot of similarity in the community of sessile invertebrates uh, across all three reefs, but that um, both erect and encrusting bryozoan cover has increased across all three reefs during this time, as has the contribution of uh, other species uh, with respect to social and better written cover. And so taken together, all this really highlights uh, how critical reference reefs are for contextualizing artificial reef performance, such as whether or not ecosystem functions are impaired by numerically abundant undesirable species, as was uh, shown between sea fans and giant kelp, whether or not an artificial reef produces and attracts reef fish, um, and whether or not an artificial reef can resemble natural reef communities and how long that takes. So this last section of the talk reviews lessons learned from the long-term monitoring, but first we'd like to highlight the value of these long-term monitoring data, um, which as Rachel's talk highlighted very nicely that these monitoring data can be used to evaluate project performance performance and I've shown leading up to these slides evidence of uh, how this is one of the very important uses of monitoring data. The rest of the talk is going to focus on these other two uses of monitoring data to ask how monitoring data can inform remedial action. And this section of the talk uses different components of the long-term monitoring data set too. So although Wheeler North Reef had similar fish biomass density to the reference reefs, it still felt short of reading that, reaching that uh, 20 ton fish standing stock design target. And so um, in 2015, we conducted analyses using the long-term monitoring data to evaluate the reasons for this failure. And I think both Rachel and uh, Dan actually touched on this a little bit, but data collected from the artificial reef uh, were used to determine the average fish standing stock that would be supported by the artificial reef given its size at the time, which was 175 acres, and that was averaged to be about 13 and a half tons. And then the same data set were used to predict the additional acres needed for, in order for Wheeler North Reef to support more consistently 28 tons of fish standing stock. And ultimately, these analyses found that Wheeler North Reef at its present size, which again was 175 acres, was too small to uh, consistently meet the fish standing stock requirement. And so the California Coastal Commission used this information to require Southern California Edison to expand the reef by adding up to 210 new acres of artificial reef. That reef, as I've mentioned before, <laughs> was constructed over a two year period. The photo on the top shows the process of uh, the construction of that remediation reef. And then the photo collage on the bottom shows what that reef rock looked like soon after it was dropped. 
And so plotted here is a fish standing stock from 2009 to 2018 before the remediation reef was added. And you can see this is this represents the fish standing stock um, from both the mitigation and experimental reef. And we have yet to meet that 28 ton design target. Then with the expansion of the, uh, of art the artificial reef, um, we see that Wheel North Reef has met the design target in two of the last four years, exceeding the design target in this last year at 35 tons. And so now the, wheel the artificial reef is on a promising trajectory. Mitigation credit is accumulating and annual site inspections will begin in 2024. So it's very cool, great success story. All right, so to summarize the lessons learned from 24 years of monitoring from the experimental reef, we learned that adult kelp density and fish biomass are similar to reference reefs um, for all the tested substrate types and cover. That kelp dispersal is widespread and can lead to high canopy cover even at low recruitment densities. The outplanting success is possible, but as was shown um, in, with the case of the experimental reef, unnecessary. From the mitigation monitoring, we learned that Wheeler North Reef supports high densities of sea fans, despite being a low relief, low cover artificial reef. Um, but those sea fans do not appear to be excluding giant kelp, and that the reef both attracts and produces new reef fish, and that the community quickly resembles that of natural reefs. From the uh, remediation reef, we learned that expanding Wheeler North Reef increased the likelihood of meeting the design target and the goal of the permit for timely mitigation. And taken together, this long-term monitoring has provided the knowledge needed to ensure that kelp resources due to the operations of songs are fully compensated. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. No question. Oh, yes. Um, in the earlier talk, you said that we had like 65 acres of kelp out of the 373. Is there an area that the 65 is concentrated in or is it spread out? Or... Yeah, most of it, if I am understanding, are on northern parts of phase three. It's uh, largely throughout much of phase three. There was not much kelp at all in phase one and phase two. Um, it's kind of baffling us because there are um, modules near those that have kelp where the older ones don't. Um, and so we're waiting to see what it looks like this year to see, you know, if that pattern is persisting. And if it is, that might be something that we really need to look at to think out why. Is there any similarity between the gaps and the reference reefs that they like? Concentrated in certain parts. Well, we saw no kelp at Santa Tail in any of our transits this year. Okay, so it's zero, right? Um, and at Barn, we've seen it, Dave, you can speak to this some, but at Barn, we've seen a decrease in kelp this year from last year. Um, but those reefs have other types of kelp, right? So it's not like it's a barren reef with nothing on it. There's pterodophora, there's laminarid on these reefs. We're just not seeing a lot of giant kelp. There are some a natural reef just in shore of the artificial reef, in shore of the phase two, the down coast portion, where we don't see hardly any giant kelp at all. And within 50 meters, 100 meters, there's some new natural rock that has been more recently exposed and it has giant kelp on it. So we don't think it's a dispersal thing. We I think something else is going on, but we don't know yet. So I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that, Dave? No, that's correct. Uh, yeah, there's this kelp in some areas, but not in others. But that's in talking to Carl Davis and down at Scripps and Point Loma, there's similar sort of patterns going on there. We see similar sort of patterns going on up in Santa Barbara area. So what we're seeing in the region down there is not unlike what we're seeing or what's being observed in other areas. It's a little bad. Yes, Bob. With regard to sea fans, uh, yeah, you showed the dramatic difference between high relief, but it, that was almost eight, eight to 13 feet tall, and, and low relief, but you have two reference reefs. You have uh, 
five five year sonar surveys, so you you know the percent cover at the at the new Wheeler North Reeves. But yeah, they're showing more sea fence. You think there's a subtlety that low relief and really low relief? What what's the I guess I'm asking what's what's the height of relief at Pendle or at Barn and San San Mateo? And you have at least a qualitative kind of assessment from from your looking at all the other biological aspects of these three reefs. Do you think it still could be that the boulders that uh, the Wheeler North Reef are just high enough to get more of this sea fan? And what what's your just opinion of how how this is going to go down? That's a great question. I have not looked at the sonar data or the cover data that closely, but maybe Dave, do you have any? Or Dan? Sorry, is your question about the height of the reef? Yeah, yeah. you see the size. Yeah, size so, of the boulders. So the difference with either height or size of the boulders, because it's all considered low relief. Yeah, three yeah. reefs. But is it really, are there subtle differences? Uh, and certainly the size of the boulders that we in our trees are more uniform than some of the other locations. Um, the size of the boulders that far kelp are much larger than we in our trees, and the size of the ones that send the tail kelp, I would say, are small. Huh. But the height wise, they're fairly similar, what? except for concentrated areas higher. What? One thing I would add would be before even phase one went in, we did. As well as Edison, we did a bunch of surveys to see what was there on the emergent rock that was present. And the little bit of emergent rock that was present in that area, one of the things we reported were numerous on those emergent rocks. Um, so surrounded by sand, surrounded by so it may be something where there's a location effect as well. I mean, we, we don't know. Um, we dove uh, San Onofre uh, a couple months ago, and there was a decent amount of risia in the San Onofre kelp forest as well. The other thing that it might be, at least be a part of it, too, is the material. You know, you know these are harder rocks than you know, the Pacific. So they're that's like the you know, system, but they're, they're very hard and different. Barn is pretty hard rock too, right? Um, I think barn is bar, the rocks of barn are definitely softer than the ones they are. are. Yeah. Okay, so those are and you can see that they're very thin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great question. Thanks, Bob. There's a lot we don't know. <laughs> there is a question in the uh, QA here. It says, that is from Chris Coldwell again. It says, can it be said now that I think that it's meant to say Wheeler North Reef? It says, West North Swims. And can it be said now that Wheeler North Reef has demonstrated a net positive fish production? And if so, how much time did it take to reach that level? Yeah, so uh, fish production on Wheeler North Reef was comparable to the reference bases in five years and has been consistently within or above the range of the reference reef since then. I think that's, but there, I think it's a little bit different to answer that question, which is it, this is more about production versus not production. I think that question is. And so I think that what Kat said is right. And it also means that adding to there's net fish production in the region um, because of it gaining the same levels as the reference rates. And now it's much, it's much higher in aggregate. Uh, I don't have any more questions. Yet. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh. Just just a comment. I I reflect back that yeah, you did a nice job of summarizing all the things. Yeah. I'm curious how you're going to summarize the experimental because that that was my job. And yeah, you did an amazing job with that. But that made me reflect back to what Dennis Bed said. He was Cal Fish and Games. Cowfish and games reef biologist, cowfish and wildlife. But uh, he made a comment to me that I'd just like to share. I think it would be encouraging. Uh, he, he got me aside when we were looking at the 
satellite thermal imagery. And, you know, it's more primitive back in those days. He said, look, this reef, there was only 24, 25 acres. He said, this reef, you can see it from outer space. And he said, it's just encouraging to me as a marine biologist to think I'm working on a project that is that significant in size. And, and it's something that a lot of marine biologists couldn't say they, they see their project from a long distance away. And, and then when you think of how big the reef is now, I wonder what the dentist would say. But you guys are all working on a really cool project. Thanks, Bob. That's a great, great comment. Yeah, Rachel. Uh, I'm Rachel Powell from the Coastal Commission. I just want to thank UT Santa Barbara for all the, the great work and Southern California Edison for being really great partners in this project. We really appreciate working with you. Thanks, Rachel. Any other comments or questions? Okay. This that's it. <laughs>